If the IRS asks for more sums than are imposed by law, or other sums that are imposed by law, they can be fired. And if they're convicted, they can go to jail. If a thief was trying to steal money from you and you somehow got away from him and were able to evade the theft, would society consider you a bad person? Obviously not, because the thief was in the wrong and you have every right to keep your money. If you keep people from stealing your stuff through whatever evasive means you can employ, you are not a criminal. And it doesn't matter if the thief dons a gun and flashes an IRS badge. Theft is theft. You work for your money, it's rightfully yours, and you have every right to keep 100% of what you earn. A big part of government propaganda is that if you don't pay your taxes, not only are you not a good citizen, you are labeled a tax cheat and therefore a criminal. And they've done such a good job convincing people that paying taxes is the patriotic duty of every warm-blooded American that even people who are the victims of the extortion of the state will look at you with scorn. Even though they know that if they could get away with not paying taxes, they themselves would employ the same evasive measures. And that's the catch. None of us likes to pay taxes. I mean, think about it. If 30% of your money is taken from you through taxation, you are literally working over three and a half months for free. This video explores a possible remedy. This is not a part of the anti-tax or tax protest movement. I've found through a lot of personal research that people who have followed the actions and advice of tax protesters, who just quit paying taxes altogether, fall prey to IRS audits and end up in drawn out legal battles, which basically ends up robbing not only their money in litigation fees and penalties, but some end up losing everything, including their freedoms because they end up in prison. And isn't that ironic? If you go to jail for not paying taxes, you're actually living off of taxes as a result of not paying taxes. It's utter insanity. Sending someone to jail for not paying taxes is like giving somebody the death penalty for attempting suicide. I do not claim to be a tax expert and I'm not interested in experimenting with your future. This video is for information purposes only. Nothing in this video is to be considered tax advice. This is David Merlin. Everything you're about to hear this guy say is a distillation of over two decades of intense research. This guy is like a dang walking tax encyclopedia. I'm gonna leave his website and all his information in the links below. If you end up checking out more of his stuff and going to his channel, tell him High Impact Flick sent you, and if enough people are interested in hearing more from him, I may do an interview with him in an upcoming video. I guarantee you, if you watch this video in its entirety, you'll glean some valuable information, and if we can make this go viral, maybe we can start to free people from their government-inflicted financial chains. This particular lesson I want to uh, impart to you the, the cornerstones of an argument that I've had up against the government many, many times, and there's a, a certain block of acquiescence that should allow us to just set a whole lot of arguments aside and get comfortable into a certain posture that uh, where I simply don't have to worry about all of the anti-tax movement theorizations, mythology, all the rest of it. I don't do any of it. You see on the board here, all I have are provisions of law. And I'm not going to write words for you on the board. I'm going to show you what different provisions of the tax code say. This will be tax code and regulations. <clears throat> regulations have a decimal point. Statutes do not for the purposes of my teaching. Okay? And I'm going to outline to you an equation of related statutes that everyone agrees applies to anyone who has sold their personal services as an employee or as an independent contractor, self-employed individual, whatever you want to call them. Anyone who sells their personal services for a living. The taxation of your pay is governed by Section 83A, Goodmanson versus the United States, Second Circuit, 2011. At the heart of this case is Internal Revenue Code Section 83A, which governs the taxation of property transferred in connection with performance of services.
That's a quote. I have case law going back to 1974, tax court, Cone versus Commissioner. Uh, the language of the section covers the transfer of all property, any property transferred in connection with the performance of services to an independent contractor, an employee, or a corporation. Period. Right. Everybody agrees. Revenue ruling 2007-19, Chief Counsel of the Internal Revenue Service, 2007-19, Revenue Ruling. Section 83A provides for the determination of what is to be included in gross income when property is transferred to an independent contractor employee in connection with the performance of services. So everyone agrees it explains how to tax a paycheck. Montelepper System Ed versus Commissioner, 1995, uh, 5th Circuit, 956 Federal 2nd, 496, 498, uh -huh. first sentence in the opinion of the court, quote, Section 83A explains how property received in exchange for services is taxed, end quote. So everybody agrees with that. Now we know we have to comply with it. Now we know the IRS has to comply with it. And we know that if the IRS asks for more or other sums than are allowed by law, mm -hmm. that the IRS agent can be fired. And if convicted, they can go to jail. They don't have to be convicted to be fired. And so what I would do if I had the time, I'll file a lawsuit against my favorite IRS agent and make them prove that they haven't asked for more money than the law permits by dragging them into Section 83 and the related statutes because they don't enforce these. Right. They ignore those so they can, you got profit and cost, two different columns, they never share a penny. They drag the value of your labor from the cost column into the profit column by depriving you of this to make it profit, 61A, gross income. That's what they do. And I'm gonna to explain to you the Section 83 equation because if you start 61A, gross income, like they do, you can't get here from there. Mm. The equation flows this direction. If you start here, you flow away from where your cost is to be determined. Section 83 determines cost. By determining cost, you figure out what your profit is, don't you? I don't know my profit till I figure my cost. It's, it's accounting 101 or earlier. It's bonehead accounting. I have to figure out my cost, then I know what my profit is. Cost defines income. Income is profit. Anybody that, t anybody that says income is not defined in the code, ask them how Section 83 operated in their conclusion that income is not defined in the tax code. They'll have to tell you, I don't know anything about Section 83. They'll have to tell you that because I'm the only one on the planet teaching it in relation to all compensation for services and yet I have all this case law and the government's best attorneys in the world in the tax division of the DOJ agreeing with me on all this Great. up to this point. I'll show you where they disagree. But what we have now is an income tax, Social Security Self-Employed Chapter 2, an income tax, Social Security Chapter 21, FICA, the employee. It's an income tax. It's a tax on profit. Section 83 applies to all compensation, so it applies to 1402A, self-employment earnings. It applies to 3121A, FICA, wages. 3121Q, FICA, tips. Mm. Section 83 applies in other chapters, and it explains how to tax you. Can you see how if it, ch if it changes the fabric of chapter one, it changes the fabric of everything? Mm -hmm. Because that's the equation you have to use to figure your cost for this income tax and this income tax, as well as the chapter one income tax, as it relates to your compensation for services. <clears throat> chapter 23, Federal Unemployment Tax Act. If you don't owe FICA, the employer does not owe the unemployment tax. That's why this is mentioned here. Because if I kill this, I kill this with it. But we're talking about income tax. This is an excise tax on employers, not on income. But it's based on whether or not the employee owed this income tax. So if I kill this, I kill this. Now, knowing as we do, and you'll see all of this on wevgov.com, all the case law that says Section 83 governs how to tax you, you'll see all these provisions, they're all there. 
and you'll see this argument framed right. The reason this is up here, IRS Publication 17, since 19, from 1993 and 1994, and I, uh, I was using a particular page as an exhibit from inside Publication 17, and in, in uh, 1995 they rewrote it. That's more than 22 years ago. This is all very old stuff. None of this is new. I know it like the back of my hand. Uh, Don will back me up on that. Yep. So we have a governing statute. How do you comply with it? It's at first, what does it say? That's how you comply with it. It doesn't say the whole paycheck's gross income. It says the excess over the amount paid is gross income. So we have to figure out the amount paid before we know what the excess over the amount paid is. The amount paid is our cost, isn't it? And only the excess over our cost is profit. 1.83-3G defines the term amount paid. For the purposes of Section 83 and the regulations there under, the term amount paid refers to the value of any money or property paid for the property 83 applies to. Any property that I paid, any means all of it. You'll see all the case law on the term any property right there on the federal income taxation page of wevgov.com. So any is all inclusive. Supreme Court says so five times up through 2008. The government won those cases arguing this way. So I know I'm arguing the way the government argues and wins in the Supreme Court five times and probably 20 cases since 2013 on the appellate level citing those Supreme Court cases agreeing that any is all inclusive and I've got a regulation 1.83-3G that defines my amount paid or my cost as the value of any money or property that I paid. How do you figure the, la uh, the value of labor? The value of property is established through the terms of an arm's length transaction. Um, U.S. Supreme Court 1973, U.S. versus Cartwright, uh, Robinson versus Commissioner, Tax Court 1970s, I think. Um, then you have uh, Treasury Regulation 27 CFR 170.150B. You have Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 109, arm's length transaction. Set of a transaction negotiated between two unrelated parties acting in their own best interest, under no compulsion to buy or sell, all relevant facts disclosed. That's me and my employer, that's me and my customer, my client, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's anybody that's unrelated to me, that doesn't have to buy my labor, and I don't have to sell my labor to them. The fact that they would buy it, and the fact that I sold it has established its fair market value. Mm -hmm. So through the terms of an arm's length transaction, the value of my labor is everything I know I get under contract. You get a pension, you get a gold watch, <laughs> you get a parking space, you might get a free lunch in the company uh, 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 lunchroom every day, but it's all in a contract. It's what an unrelated party agreed to pay me when they didn't have to and I didn't have to sell my labor it establishes the fair market value. Everything I received is within the fair market value of my labor. Mm -hmm. And so, everything I received for services actually performed is the value of the services I perform. Only the excess over the amount paid. The amount paid is the value of any money or property. Only the excess over the value of the labor is gross income. 1.83 decimal point, that means it's a regulation, 1.83-4B2, written under Section 83 of the tax code by the Secretary of the Treasury here, says to figure your cost of the property you receive for your services, you can apply Section 1012 of the regulations there under. 1.1012-1A, a regulation there under, says your cost is cash or other property. Get to the part where labor is excluded. It doesn't get to that part. The government simply does it. They say, forget it, you can't have it. And yet the law says any cash or other property, the value of any money or property paid. And we can't have this. They won't talk about it. 11th Circuit and 9th Circuit, the exchange of briefs is done. We're waiting for the court's decision. And those two are going to the Supreme Court. Five people went to the Supreme Court in the 90s. 
when I didn't have the case law about the term any property. And uh, the only way they got out of this argument is the only way out of the argument to say labor didn't cost you anything, so when you sell your labor, everything you receive is a profit. Where's your authority to exclude labor from any money or property? Where's your authority to exclude labor from cash or other property? They don't have that authority. They simply do it. It's a policy. It's a policy contrary to law that costs me money, and they know it equals extortion and racketeering. Yep. See how easy that was? They know I don't owe it. They know what they demand is contrary to law. They know it's arbitrary. It costs me money equals extortion and racketeering. It came at zero basis. And uh, conspiracy against rights, 18 U.S.C. 241, 10 years in prison. That's the least of it. They know they're depriving me of the Section 83 equation. Codebreaker, the Section 83 equation, my manual about this and only this, is on my website, wevgov.com. I don't need these provisions in front of me to tell you what they say. This is 1993 for me. This is all very old stuff. It's a statutory equation that calculates your cost, and they won't let you have it. IRS Publication 17 in 1993, they said uh, your cost is this, that, and the other thing, or the value of services you provide in the transaction. Oops, sounds just like this, doesn't it? And so I took that and I started using it as an exhibit in tax court litigation in early 94. Then the 1994 version of Publication 17 came out and said the same thing. So I took that interior page and kept using that as an exhibit. Then they rewrote Publication 17, that paragraph in Part 14 of Publication 17, to say your cost is cash or other property just like this one says. Mm -hmm. So I have, here's the good part. It went through a couple of uh, different amendments over time, but now it finally just says, your cost is cash or services. And it says right in publication 17, your cost is your right. services. Right. And all of this is about, no they're not, everything's a profit, everything you make is gross income, it's profit, and yet their publication from 1993 through 2016 says your cost is your services. So you can bet I've got one exhibit, uh, cover page, exhibit A, IRS Publication 17. Turn that page. It's a cover page of 1993, Publication 17. And you turn that page of the PDF file. The next page is the photocopy of the interior page. Then you turn that, and it's the 1994 cover of Publication 17, then the 1994. And it goes just like that. Cover, interior, cover, interior, right through 19, or right through 2016. Your cost includes your services. So their publication even says the same damn thing. They can't refute it. In, and this is the first time, and it's because I've shut off all their escape routes, all their rhetoric. This time, on the... 11th Circuit and the 9th Circuit, it was basically an identical brief. They actually mentioned this regulation in parentheses, but they didn't mention any of its language because its language drags them into all that case law, how the term any is all-inclusive. But they finally mentioned this regulation. This is a statutory challenge. 1.83-4b2 says apply section 1012 to figure your cost and the regulations there under. This regulation requires this. They didn't even mention either of these provisions or any of these on the 9th and 11th Circuit. That's pretty much a waiver. It's a waiver of an argument that says all property is a cost. You can't waive that argument and then argue that labor is, uh, your compensation is profit. You just waive this argument under a statute. This is how strong this is. They can only mention this, that's the first time, and they've had it since 1993. First time they've mentioned that regulation. They didn't mention this one or any of these provisions. 1012, your cost is cash or other property. 1011 says your cost in 1012, your basis, is also known as your adjusted basis. That's all it says. 
1001 says the adjusted basis in 1011, which is the basis in 1012, shall be restored to the taxpayer. What's left after the adjusted basis is restored, restored to the taxpayer constitutes a realized gain. This is poetry. Number 37 is 1.001-1A that tells us what to do with the realized gain or the adjusted basis. The adjusted basis is the 1012 basis, which is our cost, cash or other property. The fair market value of property is a question of fact, but only in rare and extraordinary circumstances will property be considered to have no fair market value. The general method of computing such gain or loss is prescribed by section 1001A through D, which contemplates that from the amount realized upon the sale or exchange of property, there shall be withdrawn a sum sufficient to restore the adjusted basis prescribed by 1011 and the regulations thereunder. The amount that remains after the adjusted basis has been restored to the taxpayer constitutes the realized gain. Mm. They start you with your whole paycheck yeah. in gain, yeah. profit. Everything is right there. Yeah. That's on the top line of the 1040 EC, name and address. Second line, how much did you bring in? They're starting you with everything in gross income. Mm -hmm. But if you don't start here, you lose. It flows this direction. They start you here, it flows another direction. It flows toward 151D and 63C. I'm an individual who can't be claimed as a deduction or a, a dependent, and um, I'm filing the 1040EZ. I don't itemize, and no one else can claim me as a deduction. So uh, in the, I think it was, uh, you know, the 90s, the, you could enter $6,050 as your personal exemption and standard deduction, and they won't tax you on that. But that's after you include everything in profit. Mm -hmm. right. So it's all profit. Oh, but you can deduct this at 6050 I think now it's over $10,000. The first 10500 they don't tax you on. So it's changed, but it's under 151D and 63C after it's profit. Section 83 says only the excess over the amount paid is gross income. So I have now violated Section 83 when I report as gross income the value of my labor. Now, if the IRS asks for more sums than are imposed by law, or other sums than are imposed by law, they can be fired. And if they're convicted, they can go to jail. If they're convicted. They don't have to be convicted to be fired. But to see whether or not they should be fired, I need full disclosure. In the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, they told me I have the right to a clear explanation of the laws. Helvering versus Texpen Oil Company, 1937. The taxpayers are entitled to know the basis of law and fact upon which the uh, commissioner sought to sustain the deficiencies. I want those clear explanations because I think they're asking for sums other than those imposed by law. And to hold that uh, employee, that statute, to get them fired, I'm going to sue for clear explanations, aren't I? They deprived me of Section 83 by putting everything in profit because any money or property is my cost, and yet the value of the property that I sold that is my cost, they put in profit. So it was and, a zero basis. And, right? and they can't get out of this argument any other way than to say, your labor was free, you didn't have to buy it before you sold it. And so it's all profit, and they skip all this to start you right here. Again, up against the world's greatest tax attorneys, they'll tell you so. In the Department of Justice, we have the argument to exactly this. On the 9th and 11th Circuit, it's done. The court will render its decisions. There will be parts, at least parts, that need to be appealed, and those two will go to the Supreme Court. And now we're fully loaded with all the case law that says any means all property. And they are to the point where they mentioned this one, mentioned this one, and didn't mention any of the others, and won't get into the language of the ones that they did mention. It's that bad. I've shut down, through previous litigation in criminal cases, I've shut down all the other stuff they can say because it was just too ludicrous. Uh, what they said is still ludicrous, but it's, it's got the element of evasion, so it's, it's cloaked in vagueness, this, the, Ludicrosity, what <laughs> ludicrousness. Uh, so anyway, 
They're stealing Social Security under these two chapters by depriving you of chapter provisions 83, 1111 and 12, and section 212 that says, in the case of an individual, there shall be allowed as a deduction all ordinary and necessary expenses paid or incurred in the production or collection of income. It's a general deduction of cost statute. So 83, 212, 1111 and 12, I've been deprived of for you to tax my pay. You can get fired for that because you're demanding more than the law allows, servant breath. You can go to jail for it. It's conspiracy against my rights. It's extortion and racketeering. I'm already over 50 years worth of prison chart or uh, criminal sentencing right here. 50 years worth of, of charges there, hmm. just for what they did to me. Hmm. Times 300 million. Gun owners, and again, you got a collection of bankers out there, collective of bankers that says. Let's steal from 300 million gun owners and do it this way. They think they should steal from 300 million gun owners. This is the reason I ignore the Internal Revenue Code. I sell my services, all my property is a cost, mm -hmm. and none of this is legal advice. But for my purposes, I ignore the Internal Revenue Code. And anybody mentions it to me, you're obviously after the chapter one tax. How did section 83 operate in your conclusion? My paycheck is gross income. Because I know they can't talk about it. The government, the world's best tax attorneys can't talk about it. This is just, a, this is accomplished solely through responsible analysis. That's all this is. It's always in the code. It, I didn't create any of this. I simply narrowed it down to this and we've been in litigation now with it and Don has seen the briefs, right. they can't talk about this stuff. Right. They cannot do it. They run away. And so uh, you're up to date.